Well, good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. It, we feel really honored. Good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> good afternoon. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You know, it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking like a, a Roman. Yeah, sort so, of, yeah, sort of, so, yeah, yeah. so it's a real pleasure to me and uh, to everybody here being with Professor Paul Witz. So let me introduce uh, Professor Witz. Some of you, probably many of you know him from other talks from, from the literature. So he's actually a, a present is senior scholar and professor at the Institute for the Psychological Sciences at Divine Mercy University. And he's also co-founder of this university since it, it started in 1999, I think. Yes. He received his PhD from Stanford University. He majored in personality theory and experimental cognitive psychology. And he's been a professor at NYU for yeah, many years. Yes. And now he's Professor Emeritus at NYU. He was also a professor at the John Paul II Institute in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, some of his areas of research and interest are personality theory, and its integration with Catholic theology and philosophy, I think it's the topic of the talk today, some, some of it. Uh, the nature and historical origin of human consciousness, the importance of fathers for the family, beautiful talk yesterday, so I tell you the talk is really nice. How men and women are equal in dignity but different and complementary, the psychology of atheism, the psychology of virtues, identity, hate and forgiveness, etc. And uh, let me tell you some, something about his articles, and especially books. There's many, many articles. And, uh, um, well, the books, maybe the, some of them, Faith of the Fatherless, The Psychology of Atheism, Sigmund Freud's Christian Unconscious, Psychology as Religion, The Cult of Self-Worship, Censorship, Evidence of Bias in Our Children's Textbooks, really um, well, <laughs> looming. <laughs> the self beyond the postmodern crisis, modern art and modern science, the power analysis of vision, and oh, last book, Catholic Christian Meta Model of the Person, Integration with Psychology and Mental Health Practice. I think it's the topic yes. of the talk. So, as I said before, thanks for coming, for being here. We feel really honored for counting on you with this and Professor to you the floor. Thank you, thank you, and um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, um, I will be presenting today a model, a meta-model, we'll talk about what that word means, meta-model, um, of the person. And this is the work of many people. It's it will come out, it's now in press as a book. I am one of the editors, but there are many other people who have contributed. And it has been 20 years in the making. So it is a, not my personal book. It's, I made my contribution, but there were many others as well. As I said, the book is now in press. It should officially be released uh, shortly. When it is published, it will be available in three forms. First, it will be available in a PDF, free, no cost. Second, it will be available in a hardcover. It is 26 chapters and 700 pages, so it, ha it will be available in a hardcover for libraries and for you know people who like to read from a book and have a hundred dollars or something. You know. Not your usual student. Um, and third, it will we believe will be coming. It will come out in an e-book, something like you. You, what you might put on a Kindle or something like that. Um, but please remember this is, I'm presenting it here, by the way, for the first time, uh, uh, the second time officially. So you're hearing it before it comes out. And 
I have here a pamphlet that summarizes many aspects of the book. I have ten copies. First come, first served. <laughs> but if you don't get one, there's a pad here to put your email address on, and I can send it to you by email. And you can print it up. It's in color, but it's okay in black and white, too. All right. Now, the book is a Catholic Christian meta model of the person. And so I want to put some context to that. First, the pro there, there are two problems or two issues relevant to the person today. One, our understanding of the person seems to have collapsed in much of the modern contemporary world. It's as though person has been reduced to just biological stuff that can be manipulated or social stuff that can be controlled by social ideology. The higher understanding of the person s seems to have disappeared. And there seems to be no common understanding of the person. So there is a crisis about the nature of the person, and that's one reason why, a major reason why, we're trying to put out a model of the person. Uh, we all know now that there are people trying to mix animals and humans together. Um, there are people trying to develop what they call transhuman, you know, some kind of new form of life that will be higher than us, that will be called transhuman, and we will be their, their, their servants or slaves and, uh, until we're finally of no use at all. But uh, that human beings will be uh, superseded by a higher, this is the transhuman movement. So those are all examples of how the notion of the person has been forgotten. Now, that's the bad news about the person. The good news, strangely enough, uh, that I'm going to mention, comes from psychology. As many of you know, in recent years, in the last 20 or so years, Psychology has discovered the virtues. All Dominicans are allowed to laugh. After 2,500 years, psychology has discovered the virtues. But that's very important because they will learn something about whether the virtues can be taught, when they can be taught, how they can be taught, or maybe they can't be taught. They will be very practical about the virtues. And my Dominican friends were all, and their Aristotelian friends, they were all up in the air and they talked about the virtues up here. But psychology will try to bring them into the real world. Now, why is this important? I mean, it's important in part just because the virtues are important. But let me look, let me, there's something more profound going on. From its founding, psychology was modeled on deterministic natural science. And that has worked reasonably well to understand people's pathologies. Your pathology, your problem, uh, has come from some trauma, from some uh, experience in the past. But it doesn't, but once you know the cause of your problem, then what? And modern psychology in the last 20 years, under the name is often called positive psychology. Martin Seligman was a pioneer in this. 
what they have done is not only to discover the virtues, but they have moved psychology from determinism to teleology. They have rediscovered not only the virtues, but Aristotle. Telos, purpose. And they're talking about now, what does it mean to flourish as a person? Finally, they're talking, not just your problems. Okay, you know your problems now, but now what are you going to do about it? How are you going to live in a positive way? And they've now brought in flourishing as part of psychology. So that is hopeful because it means we're moving now in the field, we're moving back to a higher understanding of the person. The culture is still behind on that. The culture still sees us in the reductionist, deterministic way. But psychology has begun to move, and that's important. And eventually, and psychology then is going to rediscover not only purpose, flourishing, and teleology, psychology is going to rediscover philosophy and theology. And there are signs that's already happening. I can mention some of those later if you're interested. All right. Now, we're, I'm going to present our model. Now, the model is a meta-model. That means it's an a higher level model. It's not a particular model of personality or psychotherapy. It's a framework in which existing models of the person, personality, and of psychotherapy are accepted as long as they are evidence-based. We are not here to say you can't be a psychoanalyst and a good Catholic Christian or you can't be a Jungian, or you can't be a cognitive behavioral therapist. We're not throwing any of that out as long as it is evidence-based. We may throw out some of the assumptions, or their ethics, or their philosophy, but that's not, that's not evidence-based psychology. So it is a framework, a meta-model. And it has three levels, three that are put together in a way that we believe they complement each other and a way in which they are integrated. And it, the three levels are theological, philosophical, psychological. We assume each of those levels remains independent and has their own epistemology, but that they cooperate in an integrated way. What does that mean? Well, it means that, let me give you a, a funny example that may help here. Um, at theology, at the theological level, there is a concept called love. You are to love God and love your neighbor. Um, there are, at the philosophical level, there are philosophical understandings of love. At the psychological level, they usually don't talk about love, but the highest level of what you mean by love might be called attachment. And you can study attachment like Bowlby did, or, you know, the attachment theorists. Many of you know about that. Or you can then study attachment at the level of behavior. You can watch a mother and child demonstrating attachment. You can then go below, and so you're still looking at love, but you could then go below and look all the way down to biochemicals like um, oxytocin. So here you can see biochemically oxytocin. You can probably go to neural structures next. 
Then you can go to watching behavior. All of that will be uh, public science. Then you can go to psychological theory, attachment, then to the philosophy of love, and finally to the theology of love. Now that vertical integration is what we mean by integration. And the model, therefore, is a laminate. Three different, we, we normally will just, we're only going to talk about three levels in the laminate. Theology, philosophy, psychology. We won't talk about biochemistry or neuroscience. But, under, but that's implicit. And a laminate is like a ski where you have one layer for strength, one for flexibility, and one, let's say, to get rid of, to have no friction with, with snow and ice or something like that. And together, each one remains its own level, but they integrate. Or sometimes I use the word, they resonate. You know, like music one octave higher or something like that. But so this is the basic notion of the model, theological, philosophical, psychological, and implicitly uh, below psychology you could have neural, neural activity and then biochemical. Um, okay. At, at each of these levels we have a set of, pr we have some what we, we have premises to explicate what we mean. By the theological level, we have three premises. At the philosophical level, we have three premises. At the psychological level, we have five premises. The model, therefore, has 11 different premises. Each premise, however, can be understood as having analogous qualities at each level. I will try to explain that later. But, and so the theological level is the capstone. And the three basic theological premises are they're Christian, they are the person is made by God in the image of God. Now we have sub-premises. I won't go into all of them because each premise has sub-premises. And you can see some of them in the handout here and in the book. The next premise is, we, and by the way, we were created by God in the image of God and because we were created by a God of love and in the image of God, we are all, every human being is of intrinsic dignity and value. So all humans, all persons, have intrinsic dignity and value. And it does not depend upon their age or their physical capacities and so forth. Because they are always, in some way, having been made by a loving God in the image of God. Each of us shows, in some way, God. Each of us expresses the image of God. And that's why we're good and have dignity. Now, by the way, no other form of psychology has a rationale equivalent to that. In fact, if you were an evolutionary psychologist, human beings have no dignity. You are here by chance and survival. Your dignity, no dignity. The second premise, theological, is we are fallen. We have, now, theologically it means we're, we are sinful and we're fallen. Of course, psychology doesn't accept that language. But psychology has diagnosed the way in which we have problems almost ad nauseum. Uh, we have, psychology has documented the ways in which human beings are fallen. In a, in a very profound sense. We are narcissistic, we are egotistic, we are self-centered, 
We are given to rage, anger. We are given to envy. We are given to all sorts of... We're, we're given to, to being depressed. We're given to being anxious and fearful. I mean, you know, all of those are the, not how we were made to be. So at least psychology has, has identified all uh, our fallenness, which they won't call that, but okay. So we're fallen. We got problems. We got big problems. Human beings have a big problem. And psychology is always telling you you have them. And the third premise is we are redeemed by Jesus Christ. Now that's explicitly Christian. And so the model is open to all forms, I believe, more or almost all forms of Christianity. But psychology has had, has its own forms of redemption already. What are they? Well, some psychologists say our redemption is in self-actualization. That's Carl Rogers. Uh, Jung, Carl Jung says our our redemption is in uh, analytic psychology in the form of self-realization. There are some narrative psychologists who actually say our, our redemption is in a new story of our life that is called redeeming explicitly. There are narrative psychologists which talk about rede redeeming stories as the answer to psychotherapy. Um, Seligman and positive psychology would say our redemption is in flourishing through the expression of virtues. So psychology has redemption in a different way. But it has redemption. Okay, so those are the theological premises at the top. Next come the philosophical premises. And the first philosophical premise is that we are a body-soul unity. We are a unit, the person is a unity. Now this is a uh, the body-soul unity is explicitly Christian, although I think also Aristotelian, but I'm not sure. No. I'm not a philosopher, so, you know, the philosophers can get their guns ready. Uh, um, but this is very similar to many holistic psychologies. Existential psychology, um, various holistic psychologies say we're a unity. But we're explicitly a body-soul unity. And we're reintroducing the notion of soul. Ex I mean, explicitly putting it in. I don't want to go into that issue here, but maybe later it would be possible to talk to you about it. But I think the soul has, has a future for being understandable in a positive way in psychology. But we also emphasize the body. So the bo we are not just, we're not a mind and a body a la Descartes. We are a soul body unity. Second philosophical premise. We are all called to vocation. And we have three vocations. Every human being, we argue, has three vocations. One is a vocation to personal, well, we, for, for Christians it would be personal holiness, but for all people it would be personal development. Spiritual or intellectual personal development. That's vocation one. Vocation two is we are all called to a state in life. We're all called to be single or married or consecrated, you know, like the priesthood or the consecrated women. 
And so we're called, and we're all born single. So at some point in our life, we're all called to the single life. And we may be called after, even though we're married, if, if we become a widow or widower, we may be called again to the single life. But we're all called to one of those states. And that's part of who we are as a person. It has to be understood by psychology. And finally, the third vocation, we're all called to some kind of, I guess you call it work, social ex contribution to the society, not necessarily paid work. A mother may be called without being paid, but she's sure by helping with her children, she's doing a wonderful thing uh, for other people, not just her children, but the society. Or you may be called to be a clinical psychologist. God help you. Or you may be called to be a professor or a, a scientist, a priest, or whatever. So we're all called to positive work and to some extent leisure, I say, productive leisure with that. So we all, everybody has those three vocations, whether they're a, a Christian or not. All people are called to those three vocations, we believe, to some kind of work, some kind of state of life, and to some kind of personal movement toward a higher, uh, uh, better being. So that we're all called a, a vocation is the second philosophical premise. It's the fifth premise of the model. We have three theological. We're going to have three philosophical. We've now done the second philosophical is the vocation. The third philosophical premise is the, that we are called to the virtues as the way to work out our vocation. We are called to develop the life of virtue as a mechanism for the development of our vocation or as a way of developing uh, the, our vocation. So we're all called to virtue. And there we agree with Seligman and positive psychology. So three, three, and now we come to the five um, premises that are psychological. Um, the first psychological premise is that we are interpersonally relational. That as persons, we come into existence through our interaction with other persons. Now, that, in a lot of American psychology, that was neglected for a long time. The idea was that we were all autonomous individuals and as Sartre would say, hell is other people. Well, no. As we argue, heaven is other people. Right? Uh, but anyway, the, the psychological premise is that we're called into existence through our interpersonal relationships. And you can give a nice Trinitarian rationale for that. Right? Or if you're not a Trinitarian, you can talk to a Jew who will look at the, at the Old Testament and, and what, are, what does God say? What are we called to? We're called to two things. We're called to love God and to love other people. So that's for anyone who just, just in Genesis, you know, I mean, there we are. That's interpersonal. And we're called to an interpersonal God. So the first thing is we say we're interpersonal. That's the first premise. The second, per, or, that is, we're relational interpersonally. Our second uh, psychological premise is that we, as persons, this is sort of obvious, but anyway, but we thought it was still important. We, we have a sensory, perceptual, cognitive nature. Uh, this is, means we, we, we are in touch with the outside world. 
that reality is there and that we are connected to it through our senses, our perception, and many even of moderately level cognitions. That are, I mean, animals have cognitions. They can have memory and learning and, you know, that's not just sensory and perception. So that's, we have that as part of it. And that's what a lot of psychology studies, you know, when in the history of psychology, psychophysics, you know, under, you know, Fechner and Wundt, if you remember all those people, uh, that was how they first began studying the human being under sensory and perceptual, gestalt psychology, you know, all of that. But we admit that's there, that's an important part of us, sensory perceptual cognitive. The third um, psychological premise is that we are emotional. We have emotions, emotions are very important. Um, uh, nobody seems to disagree with that. Um, what to do with them is another problem. The Stoics have one answer. Uh, emotional focused therapy has another. But our emotions are a basic aspect of our of a person. Then we are rational. That is the fourth psychological premise. We are rational, we are intelligent, we use language, and part of this in the way of the sub-premises, there is something called human consciousness which is distinct from animal consciousness and which is unique to humans. Animals have awareness. We have consciousness. And that allows us to have what we would call culture, and it's intimately connected with the fact that we have language. So we are rational. And finally, the fifth premise that psychologically is that we, have, we are volitional, we have a will, and in part we are free. And therefore we become responsible for many of our actions. Not for all of them. If I should burp, no. And some of our other actions are maybe completely out of our control in the case of some men. We're all aware of people who are addicted and of the sense in which the will has been compromised. But those are the 11 premises now of the model. Each of them has a, a central level at which it is conceptualized, theological, philosophical, or psychological. But each of them have aspects of them that can be uh, presented at the other levels as well. Now, what are some of the consequences of this for mental health practice. Um, first of all, it expands our, our, our view of the person by including in the understanding of the person both vocation and the virtues which are not part of any standard understanding of the person in psychology today. The virtues is sort of coming in, but it's not in most psychotherapy at all. There people are beginning to introduce into psychotherapy training in virtues as an answer to some of their problems. They have introduced already forgiveness into psychotherapy as an intervention to help people overcome some of their depression or their anxiety. But in general, our understanding of persons in psychology, in the, in the theories of personality, and in the applied areas of all kinds of psychotherapy has ignored both the virtues and always the vocation. 
but you need to know that the meaning of that person that you're addressing in therapy is related to their state in life. You need to know, are they married or not married or what? Uh, what is their state in life? That's very relevant. Is that part of their problem? All right, so it expands the vision of the person. It enriches mental health practice by bringing these things into practice, by bringing them into the mental health activity. These issues are brought right into the counseling and therapeutic situation. And this then benefits the client. And by the way, it means also you can bring in, for religious clients, Christian clients, you can bring in the theological issues, and I will get back to that in a minute. And that, that benefits the client. And one of the other things that this model does is it, is it supports and clarifies the clinicians, the clinical psychologist's Christian identity. Now this does not mean in psychotherapy that you use that in any way to talk about Christianity with somebody who's not Christian. No. But it does mean that everybody you see, you want to find out about their vocation, you want to find out about how they're dealing with their virtues. Now let me explain what dealing with virtues brings into therapy that's new. Most therapy concentrates on the person's problems, on their weakness. Okay, you're anxious. Okay, you know, tell me about it. it all goes back to the, and your anxiety or your depression. The virtues are to say, now let's, can we see where this, your client has some strengths? And let's see if we could encourage ways in which to develop the strengths that would help them. You don't look at, this, at the person as just bringing to you their problems. They're bringing to you some of their strengths that would help you with the answers. And the same with vocation. Now, this, and as far as bringing in the Christian aspect, you don't bring it in at all unless they ask for it and are Christian or are Catholic, particularly. But here's an example. Um, there is a Jewish uh, psychiatrist at Harvard named. Uh, Rosemarin, and he's a well-trained cognitive behavioral scientist, psychologist. And he has discovered that if you're dealing with a Jewish client, if you bring in their faith, their Jewishness, along with the cognitive behavioral techniques, it greatly facilitates improvement and, and positive response in the client. And he's just published a book to this effect. In other words, dealing with the larger understanding of the person, bringing in their faith, instead of just concentrating on the problem, has allows them to bring in other forms of understanding and to give them to facilitate improvement. I would propose the same thing would be the case with Christian and in particular with Catholic clients. That if you allow that to come in, it will facilitate their improvement. Whether you're operating from a cognitive behavioral point of view, or from a psychodynamic point of view, or from an emotion focused point of view, whatever, they're different therapeutic um, techniques that you learn that are helpful, especially with certain kinds of problems and so forth. And these are good, practical, applied psychology. But when you bring in this larger framework, it look it, increasingly now it's beginning to look like the whole person is being addressed and it is facilitating their recovery and improvement.
Should I quit now and take answers, questions? Okay, let's, all right, we'll, we'll, we'll do that now. But it, it, I hope you see that you could, there's a kind of way of putting the different disciplines together in an integrated hierarchical fashion. Um, now, I don't want to say that the higher levels are better but we all know theology is the queen of the sciences, right? <laughs> anyway, no. Um, but you can put them together where they mutually support each other. It's something like with a microscope, at different levels of magnification, you gain precision at one level and lose it at others. But it may still be that you're still looking, you're looking at, the microscope may be looking at tissue from the same person at different levels of magnification. And finally you get down to the DNA and trying to figure out that, you know, wow, that's pretty low level. But you can go all the way up to, you know, looking at it as somebody's skin tissue or the, their arm even. Uh, and say, well, your problem is you have poison ivy, not that you have a genetic uh, uh, skin disease. But at any rate, um, there's a sense in which this hierarchy is naturally related to both the gaining of knowledge at one level and the loss of it at the other levels. And if you can put these things together, we can begin to integrate our knowledge. And I, I would hope you could do it in other sciences too. I don't know, that's up to them. So, enough, questions? Yes. And I, I just wanted to start saying that it was, a, it, was, it was really beautiful listening to such an, um, an illuminating way of seeing things as I, I liked this uh, integral approach you know, of all the dimensions of, of what is a human being. Um, I wanted to ask a couple of things on, in terms of what's occurring in the world today because I have children that are in the school systems where their, their mission is to form the future persons of the world because no longer the family seems to be involved as much as the actual school systems. And so um, we've noted, we've been in several schools, our children I should say, have changed from one to the other. And they all have um, in systems of um, tailleurs, they call them, of, of teaching interiority, interiorism. So it used to be um, workshops on developing emotional problems, as had, like psychology or helping your child um, resolve, um, resolve himself, or say how to, how to be a civil person, because um, we live in a socialist state in Spain, so it's very important um, the fact that um, the government, I should say, sort of inter intercedes with this uh, objective of that uh, each child needs to be able to live with his mates, right, and there's a higher uh, incidence of aggressivity and all these things, and, and I've noticed that um, in these programs of, they're basically psychological programs, and so what you were saying was very interesting um, that they need to, um, they have a sort of a, a Christian idea now in psychology, which is your redemption. So it goes beyond just um, resolving or noting that you have problems. Now what do we want to do about them? Because we want to make these children be able to live in the world, right? And, and necessarily uh, without God, because unfortunately uh, God is not uh, um, a... <laughs> Not a slash, uh, and and there's this idea that we can resolve our problems without God. No, it has a society, right? And so, I note in these um, what you were saying about this this idea of that they're looking now to have the redemption theory in in how a, uh, how a child can flourish, um, discovering virtues, right? And I and I agree with that. And then I wanted to uh, ask though, because uh, in what we're seeing in those in these systems of of teaching children how to flourish. Um, much, uh, much more emphasis given on the auto domination of their how to how to how to manage their emotions. So it's a sort of a very uh, Buddhist um, approach, which is funny because they try to use it as a sort of a um, uh, theological approach. Because as you said, they've they've tried to take it to the next level, realizing right. Right, but uh, since Buddhism isn't a religion, it's a philosophy, it's, a, it's interesting that they are using this approach because um, the solution is that if a person can, can reach 
this nirvana state of, of controlling completely all of their emotions, then they're sort of auto-realized. So they're, they're auto, uh, I'm speaking Spanish. Self-realized, I'm sorry, I've been here too long. <laughs> and um, so I guess my question to you would be, uh, how would you address this, this new trend, or how would you answer uh, to these people who, who have taken it sort of to the next level, beyond just flourishing, um, to this next level of, of, of and this gives way to my second question, uh, yeah, that you can sort of resolve everything within yourself once you've learned how to flourish, once you've learned how to be positive, you can sort of control completely your own life and your own destiny and your own uh, reaching your own end as a person, your ultimate, uh, you know, um, success as a person um, without God. In this. And then the second question is, regarding this is um, when you mentioned uh, the part about vocation, um, I wanted to say um, part of the reason I notice that psychology, including in these programs that they're using on my children, um, it's never considered the vocation aspect because at the same time they're promoting what is called this gender ideology, which doesn't seem relevant, but if you think about it, it really is because it's a system of teaching your children, because I see it, I see what they've been teaching them, uh, to think that your person is just something that's sort of fluid, or sorry, that your vocation or who you are, or your cultural context, your, your religious context, your familial context is not something that's solid and identifiable, but rather something that tomorrow I'm this, and the next day I'm that, and, so, and, they, and they want the children to think this because it's sort of a psychological tool to open up a child to be formed in whichever way they want and to be manipulated psychologically in whichever way they want. And so those are my two sort of questions. I don't know if I explained them very well. <laughs> yeah, well, look, the, these, your questions, um, no, 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 no. Oh. It's, uh, it's for, for I the just next, want to make noise sorry. that would have to be your answer. Answer. I can answer now. Okay, yeah. All right, well, first of all, those have to do with um, society and, to some extent, politics. Uh, but I guess I would say this. The great conflict between... Uh, Peter Craig wrote a very excellent book on comparing Christianity with Buddhism. And... Buddhism, in a sense, is the highest form of natural religion. It's natural, it's not revealed, and it's human. But the problem with Buddhism is, that, 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 as far as I'm concerned, is this. Christianity, the highest form of being, is not to have no emotions. And it's not to have control of your emotions so that you have no desire. I mean, Buddhism is to get rid of desire. Christianity allows one fundamental desire to be expressed, and that's the desire for love. And I think if you can ever put love in a more concrete way as the alternative, love will win out. In other words, a life without love is a Buddhist life. Love is a desire. We love God, we love others, and it has within it a dependence on the other, and that we're interpersonal and created in our relationships with persons. Buddhism, everything implodes on the self, isolated from the other, and uh, it's a kind of really fancy, well, anyway, you know, and, and it's very un- interpersonal. And it actually reduces in practice, in social practice, to every person being, in some sense, divine. By that I mean they consider themselves the center of everything. Because they are the center of everything they're creating inside. And a society with a lot of, you know, how many, what's the population of Spain? Okay. 48, imagine 48 million supreme beings. <laughs> you know, it, it destroys society because there's no con concern for the other. And so what I would say is that this will be a disaster. 
And in the United States, this is one of the reasons why mo so many people are hostile to the government. Government is known intrinsically to be your enemy and has been known since the founding of the country. That is not so true in Europe. Because your government was always the only thing that saved you from another per another country's government. <laughs> your neighbor. So you had to count on the government. But, the, the, but I'm convinced it will socially not work. So, but the way, how do you, how do you deal with it? One way is to point out that this self-control and removal of desire Buddhism is to remember, it's to, you, suffering in Buddhism is caused by desire. And the way you get rid of suffering, because suffering is meaningless, is to get rid of desire. And when you have no desire, you will be at peace. You will be a lonely, isolated, at peaceness, at, you know, at peace, supposedly. Now, I don't think that will be, I don't know that this is the answer for everybody, but I'll give an example that I heard of. This was in uh, California some years ago. Um, I talked to uh, somebody who was very close to another young man, and he had joined an ashram. And so he was involved in this kind of, you know, not just a little bit in school, but, you know, full-time uh, Buddhist movement. And he said, uh, I finally became, I reached, was it Centauria? Anyway, I reached sort of a nirvana. And he said, I was, in, I was totally alone in an infinite universe. And he says, it was absolutely frightening. Hmm. And he said, suddenly in my fear, I felt two hands reach down and pull me out. And he was suddenly, as he came out of that, he remembered the creed. And Christ descended into hell and pulled him out. I know another example. An acquaintance of, of mine, a uh, half Jewish atheist artist, had a very profound near death experience when he was in his early 40s, related to a sudden, unexpected medical problem that almost killed him. At the beginning of his near-death experience, as he was moving away from the hospital, and he could see himself lying on the gurney and his wife weeping next to him, he was moving, and other people, other spirits came with him. And they kept moving further and further away, and finally, these other spirits attacked him. And he fought back. His but he couldn't do very much. They were overwhelming him. And finally, he heard a voice that said, pray. He did not know how to pray. So he had said, he started saying things like, God bless America and things. <laughs> you know, or things like that. He didn't know, you know, or my country is a D or something. You know, he started saying things like that. And, and once he did say our father or something and so forth. And they all, they ran away like they were being hit with hot water. Now here's the point. They all went away. And they left him alone. And so here he was also alone. And he saw, thought to himself, it's horrible, I'm all alone. No, out here in this space. It's better to have them come back. You see, it's better to have enemies than nobody. 
Okay, so I think the answer to the philosophy, how to apply it, is, is an art that each of you would, might have to would be attentive to, is to show love. Love is what is the an answer to being completely alone and without desire. And our Lord has shown us that suffering is not necessarily all bad or always bad. But how you show love, I don't know. These are your children, you're a mother, you have a good chance to... <laughs> But they will. But let them know that that it, that it is that they're asking you to become a person without any desire. You control everything by allowing no desire to come into your mind. Say, virtue, virtue well, without. I know, but virtue, even virtue, is a desire, and they're going to have trouble there. Uh, yeah, they're not consistent, but you know what I mean. Most of us are. That's the best I can say. Other than that, we're going to have to have a different government or be part of a different nation. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. <laughs> First, <laughs> I wanted to tell you about. My background is by disorder, medicine, theology, and education. In the last 20 years, I have made some research and directed several works, doctoral works, about what was going on on religious education, especially in the United States in the last century. So I discovered some things, and I'm working on it also in, a pra in the practical field, working with schools here in this country and also in America, basically in Latin America, <laughs> but a little bit on other sides, and in some schools in Europe, in Kowling, working a little bit here. <laughs> but I, I wanted to ask you um, two questions. One, uh, what would you say to help us, this uh, scientific and university community, to go on in this interdisciplinary way? From the uh, how how go forward working uh, from from your field and uh, helping us uh, in getting involved in the uh, work. In education, in the educational field, educational field, um, I am interested more in the religious education, and so, what could be some some directions? And in second question is, what could you say to our families in the schools? Look. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I, 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 the discovery of the virtues by psychology is important because I think it will eventually, even Martin Seligman said that the virtues do require an, a morality and, and you know, they require the contributions of philosophers and theologians. He says that. But he says, I'm not a philosopher and I'm not a theologian, so I'm going to study the virtues as a psychologist. Well, fair enough, you know. But to the extent that the virtues are, redis are rediscovered, it means that like look, the two greatest Greek philosophers, Aristotle and Plato, both came late in the history of, of Greece, a after they'd already seen a lot of collapse in their own culture. And we're now maybe in something of an analogous position and we're rediscovering the virtues. The virtues will lead us eventually, will lead people to higher understandings of life. So it's a, once we move to teleology in our intellectual life, 
inevitably it's going to lead to, I think, philosophical and theological answers. And the answer to Buddhism, we've already, you know, that's not a theological answer. It's really, a, it is a kind of quasi-religion, but it's not, they don't, and for, among other things, Islam would reject it completely. Right? I mean, we all believe Islam, Jew, uh, Jews, and Christians all believe in, in, in a God. And so, um, the, the, the godless world of no desire will not really satisfy people very long. And the way in which you point this out is up to each situation and up to you and the person you're dealing with and so on. That, that will be an art form. How you do that, I, you know, there are no rules. Uh, but in education, I would say that in any... I can't believe that, you know, let's try to develop courage in, in our students, for example. Well, what do you mean by that? Some students might be anxious. Anxiety is fear, and it's a sign of fearfulness. So you'd say, well, let's develop courage in our children. Let's give them ways to control their fear. And you give them exercises or little tasks, or you help each other in different ways. Well, I don't know how you would do this. This is educational theory, how you do it. Or the same with the, the virtue of justice or the virtue of wisdom. Uh, these are things that you might want to bring in. Wisdom is a better name than prudence. Okay? And by the way, that's what Seligman calls it. Not prudence, he calls it wisdom. Courage and justice he calls um, by their classical names. One virtue that I think is really needed, sub-virtue, but an important one, is self-control. And particularly boys need it. They need to control both violence and sexuality. And if you cannot control your, your anger, your violence, and your sexuality, you cannot ever develop courage. I mean, if you can't control your emotions, you can't control your fear. And, and courage is to control your fear, not to be enough. And courage doesn't mean you don't have fear. If you're realistic, you've got to have fear in certain situations, you know. It's to be able to, to, to control the fear. And in spite of fear, realize you must do something. Um, and so self-control would be a very important virtue. Um, to some extent, it is taught in athletics, but that's usually self-control of violence, not sexuality. So I would push toward education that develops the virtues, and they're going to drift in the right direction. And that is not a form of no ego or no of, of getting rid of desire. Virtues require a desire. That's my, you know, you know, you, I mean, these kind of questions I haven't thought of before. I don't know what, you know, so I'm winging it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Years ago, I, I with another graduate student, I did an experiment in the seventh and eighth grade. The, the students were seventh and eighth grade students. They were in Catholic schools, but they were pretty rough. Catholic schools, that is, close to the inner city. And in there, in a, they had a course that lasted a semester that was available. And we went, we were, we taught them the virtue of altruism. Now we didn't, we gave it, the definition of altruism was people helping people. Okay. And, and let me explain. First, we would tell them what it was, 
Then we showed them movies that had clips of altruism. You could take regular movies and every now and then you could find a section, you know. And then uh, we had them do a little play acting. You know, they would play out altruistic scenes. As it turned out, those three things, maybe they were significant, but they had no real impact on them. But we had a fourth requirement. And that was they had to do an altruistic act every day and write it down in a journal and hand it in as an assignment once a week. They had to help somebody do something good. It could be they could help their sister at home do something for their mother or father. They could help an old lady across the street. They could uh, translate some woman's dealing with a document from Spanish into English and back, you know, so whatever. Some of them actually, and so they all knew they had to do one a day. And they would write them down. And at the end of, you know, you have a class of 30 students. At the end, you have 30 altruistic acts a week. At the end of 10 weeks, they've done 300 of them. It was the doing that made the difference. Altruism is a performing art. It is not an idea. It requires practice. It's like playing the piano or playing baseball. You have to know how to play it. You can't be a good commentator about baseball and be a, you know, that, hey, that, that, that's all talk. And at the end of that course, and we did it in over three semesters in three different schools. In each class, at the end of the semester, we, we gave them $50 cash. And they could do with that whatever they wanted. They could have had a pizza party. All of them voted to give it to charity of some kind. All three. All three said $50 is too small. All three created some way to add to that. And all three gave over $100 to some charity. They all picked different, they didn't, the, the charity was different. In one it was to the retired sisters that were living in a convent. In another it was to, uh, to the hospital for, for cancer and children or what, you know, different. And one, this was, we, when we did this it was done during, um, well, this, people were all as concerned at the time of, about students having self-esteem. Well, the answer to that came up in one of the, in spontaneously, one of the, one of the students, a young girl there said, I know I am a good person because I do good things to other people. A no-brainer. But you have to do things and so virtues are something you, is a performing art where people can see it. They can see your courage. They can see your dignity. They can see your calmness and lack of fear. They can see your happiness and lack of depression. They can see these virtues and they have to be practiced. So in school they should be practiced. And this was the only psychology experiment in which we had parents calling up the school and saying, I don't know what you're doing with this, but I want my younger child to have the same experiment. Because the kids started doing positive things. You know, it was their assignment, but they got into it. Okay, so maybe the last question by Pablo Dabdu. Yeah. Here, from Pablo. Yes. Uh, thank you for the brief presentation. Um, I wanted to ask about the positive psychology. Uh, in the last 19 years of positive psychology, uh, 
both Seligman and I think Peterson, Sister Mihaly and all this, the, the gurus of positive psychology have presented it like the social science equivalent to Aristotelian virtue ethics. Nonetheless, there's been like a lot of philosophic reviews saying that Seligman doesn't truly understand what Aristotle meant. And also they say that sometimes he uses it as a ventriloquist dummy no? to defend their own thesis no? or their preconceived thesis. Um, what I wanted to ask, when you say at the beginning that the good thing about positive psychology is that they are recovering the notions of character, virtue, morality, and you said te teleology. I think they have recovered the, the language of virtues, the Aristotelian language, which I think it's great because it disappeared from psychology like in, in the beginning of the last century. But I mean, when you say about teleology, they are not, I mean, from what I read in Seligman, it seems to me that when you look at, at all the positive psychology, you say, hey, they are like speaking of some kind of telos. But when you look closely, they are like... Well, he writes books on flourishing, his recent books. I, I have read the recent he book. Dropped, he dropped happiness, you know, he said how to be happy, and he got rid of Yes, it. yes, he yes. He had to go to something like flourish. I know the both books, the, the authentic happiness and then the flourish from happiness to well-being. But the thing is, uh, I mean, in the first book he's saying that he's truly Aristotelian. And in the second book he's saying that he's dropping Aristotle. But in the second book, I think he's being more Aristotelian than in the first one. <laughs> yes. But the thing is, uh, I mean, what he says, and he constantly repeats it, is that psychology is an experimental science. It's not philosophy. So it cannot be asking the questions about what things are, about the essence of things. They're just describing things. They're being analytical and describing. That's why he's always saying we can never be prescriptive. We can just be descriptive. We have to describe what can happen, but we can never make the commitment to say this is good or this is bad. That, that, well, he can say that, but this is why I'm saying we have to bring in philosophy explicitly, yes. like in the meta model. And the answer to these problems that you're talking about is psychology has made an important step, but it hasn't gotten to the true understanding of the philosophical meaning of the virtues. Yeah, yeah. But that's up to you. That's your challenge. He's given you the opportunity, which wasn't there before. Which is great, which is great. And so I can imagine the philosophers have all kinds of criticisms of Seligman. I, I know, uh, I have a philosopher friend who's one of the co-editors here named Titus. Uh, and, and, you know, he, he, he writes against, he, he talks about what's wrong with Seligman. But what's wrong with Seligman is your opportunity. Hmm. What Seligman needs is a nice way in which you can clearly meld the empirical science. You have to, you, the next step is required. You must move from what is observed to what sh should be done. Hmm. And to say that the virtues are good is already to say that even though he's a psychologist. He's slipped there. He said it's good to be virtuous. It's good to be courageous. It's, he said that, implicit. That's implicit. there. Why would you want to learn to be courageous or, or, or brave? You know, or why would you want to learn to be prudent and, and all of these things? Why? Only because it's good. And he's implicitly brought goodness there. But what it has to be done now is the philosophical and theological rationale of it has to be spelled out. And that's you got that's the job for you guys. You gotta remember he began <laughs> years ago as an experimental psychologist, studying dogs and, and, and uh, animals. And so you you know so you're right, the criticisms are right, but the answer to them is up to you guys to show that is up to philosophers and theologians to show how the implicit morality of the virtues can be made explicit and within what rational framework.
Am I clear? Yes. And that will be wonderful. Do you see that? <laughs> but that's the next step. That's the good news. There's the next step. That's the next Unfortunately, step. Unfortunately, we are running out of time. So, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think it's a good Sorry. moment to, to stop. I think that, well, a big thank you for this inspiring talk and uh, promoting this interdisciplinary work among all the disciplines. And uh, I think that we can thank the speaker. Some applause.